This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Conclusion To the sick the doctors wisely recommend a change of air and scenery. Thank heaven here is not all the world. The buckeye does not grow in New England, and the mockingbird is rarely heard here. The wild goose is more of a cosmopolite than we. He breaks his fast in Canada, takes a luncheon in the Ohio, and plumes himself for the night in a southern bayou. Even the bison, to some extent, keeps pace with the seasons cropping the pastures of the Colorado only till the greener and sweeter grass awaits him by the Yellowstone. Yet we think that if rail fences are pulled down and stone walls piled up on our farms, bounds are henceforth set to our lives, and our fates decided. If you are chosen town clerk, forsooth, you cannot go to Tierra del Fuego this summer, but you may go to the land of infernal fire nevertheless. The universe is wider than our views of it. Yet we should oftener look over the tafferel of our craft, like curious passengers, and not make the voyage like stupid sailors picking oakum. The other side of the globe is but the home of our correspondent. Our voyaging is only great circle sailing and the doctors prescribe for diseases of the skin merely. One hastens to southern Africa to chase the giraffe. But surely that is not the game he would be after. How long, pray, would a man hunt giraffes, if he could? Snipes and woodcocks also may afford rare sport, but I trust it would be nobler game to shoot one's self. Direct your eye inward and you'll find a thousand regions in your mind yet undiscovered. Travel them, and be expert in home cosmography. What does Africa, what does the West, stand for? Is not our own interior white on the chart, black though it may prove, like the coast when discovered? Is it the source of the Nile or the Niger or the Mississippi or a northwest passage around this continent that we would find? Are these the problems which most concern mankind? Is Franklin the only man who is lost that his wife should be so earnest to find him? Does Mr. Grinnell know where he himself is? Be rather the Mongo Park, the Lewis and Clark and Frobisher of your own streams and oceans. Explore your own higher latitudes, with shiploads of preserved meats to support you, if they be necessary, and pile the empty cans sky-high for a sign. Were preserved meats invented to preserve meat merely? Nay, be a Columbus to whole new continents and worlds within you, opening new channels, not of trade, but of thought. Every man is the lord of a realm beside which the earthly empire of the Tsar, a hummock left by the ice. Yet some can be patriotic who have no self-respect, and sacrifice the greater to the less. They love the soil which makes their graves, but have no sympathy with the spirit which may still animate their clay. Patriotism is a maggot in their heads. What was the meaning of that South Sea exploring expedition with all its parade and expense but an indirect recognition of the fact that there are continents and seas in the moral world to which every man is an isthmus or an inlet, yet unexplored by him, 
but that it is easier to sail many thousand miles through cold and storm and cannibals in a government ship, with five hundred men and boys to assist one, than it is to explore the private sea, the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean of one's being alone. Eret et extremos alter scrutetor iberos, plus habit hic vitae, plus habit il vie. Let them wander and scrutinize the outlandish Australians. I have more of God, they more of the road. It is not worth the while to go round the world to count the cats in Zanzibar. Yet do this even till you can do better, and you may perhaps find some Symes hole by which to get at the inside at last. England and France, Spain and Portugal, Gold Coast and Slave Coast, all front on this private sea, but no bark from them has ventured out of sight of land though it is without doubt the direct way to India. If you would learn to speak all tongues and conform to the customs of all nations, if you would travel farther than all travelers, be naturalized in all climes, and cause the sphinx to dash her head against a stone, even obey the precept of the old philosopher, and explore thyself. Herein are demanded the eye and the nerve, only the defeated and deserters go to the wars, cowards that run away and enlist. Start now on that farthest western way, which does not pause at the Mississippi or the Pacific, nor conduct toward a worn-out China or Japan, but leads on direct, a tangent to this sphere, summer and winter, day and night, sun down, moon down, and at last earth down too. It is said that Mirabeau took to highway robbery to ascertain what degree of resolution was necessary in order to place oneself in formal opposition to the most sacred laws of society. He declared that a soldier who fights in the ranks does not require half so much courage as a footpad, that honor and religion have never stood in the way of a well-considered and a firm resolve. This was manly as the world goes, and yet it was idle, if not desperate. A saner man would have found himself, often enough, in formal opposition, to what are deemed the most sacred laws of society, through obedience to yet more sacred laws, and so have tested his resolution without going out of his way. It is not for a man to put himself in such an attitude to society, but to maintain himself in whatever attitude he find himself through obedience to the laws of his being, which will never be one of opposition to a just government, if he should chance to meet with such. I left the woods for as good a reason as I went there. Perhaps it seemed to me that I had several more lives to live, and could not spare any more time for that one. It is remarkable how easily and insensibly we fall into a particular route, and make a beaten track for ourselves. I had not lived there a week before my feet wore a path from my door to the pond-side, and though it is five or six years since I trod it, it is still quite distinct. It is true, I fear, that others may have fallen into it, and so help to keep it open. The surface of the earth is soft and impressible by the feet of men, and so with the paths which the mind travels. How worn and dusty, then, must be the highways of the world, how deep the ruts of tradition and conformity! I did not wish to take a cabin passage but rather to go before the mast and on the deck of the world, for there I could best see the moonlight amid the mountains. I do not wish to go below now. 
I learned this, at least, by my experiment, that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams, and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. He will put some things behind, will pass an invisible boundary, new, universal, and more liberal laws will begin to establish themselves around and within him, or the old laws be expanded and interpreted in his favor in a more liberal sense, and he will live with the license of a higher order of beings. In proportion as he simplifies his life, the laws of the universe will appear less complex, and solitude will not be solitude, nor poverty poverty, nor weakness weakness. If you have built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. That is where they should be. Now put the foundations under them. It is a ridiculous demand which England and America make, that you shall speak so that they can understand you. Neither men nor toadstools grow so, as if that were important, and there were not enough to understand you without them, as if nature could support but one order of understandings, could not sustain birds as well as quadrupeds, flying as well as creeping things, and hush and woe, which Bright can understand, were the best English. As if there were safety in stupidity alone. I fear chiefly lest my expression may not be extravagant enough, may not wander far enough beyond the narrow limits of my daily experience, so as to be adequate to the truth of which I have been convinced. Extravagance. It depends on how you are yarded. The migrating buffalo which seeks new pastures in another latitude is not extravagant, like the cow which kicks over the pail, leaps the cow-yard fence, and runs after her calf in milking time. I desire to speak somewhere without bounds like a man in a waking moment, to men in their waking moments. For I am convinced that I cannot exaggerate enough even to lay the foundation of a true expression. Who that has heard a strain of music feared then lest he should speak extravagantly any more for ever? In view of the future or possible. We should live quite laxly and undefined in front, our outlines dim and misty on that side, as our shadows reveal an insensible perspiration toward the sun. The volatile truth of our words should continually betray the inadequacy of the residual statement. Their truth is instantly translated. Its literal monument alone remains. The words which express our faith and piety are not definite, yet they are significant and fragrant, like frankincense to superior natures. Why level downward to our dullest perception always, and praise that? as common sense. The commonest sense is the sense of men asleep, which they express by snoring. Sometimes we are inclined to class those who are once and a half witted with the half witted, because we appreciate only a third part of their wit. Some would find fault with the morning red, if they ever got up early enough. They pretend, as I hear, that the verses of Kabir have four different senses, illusion, spirit, intellect, and the exoteric doctrine of the Vedas. 
but in this part of the world it is considered a ground for complaint if a man's writings admit of more than one interpretation, while England endeavors to cure the potato rot. Will not any endeavor to cure the brain rot? which prevails so much more widely and fatally. I do not suppose that I have attained to obscurity, but I should be proud if no more fatal fault were found with my pages on this score than was found with the Walden ice. Southern customers objected to its blue color, which is the evidence of its purity, as if it were muddy, and preferred the Cambridge ice, which is white, but tastes of weeds. The purity men love is like the mists which envelop the earth, and not like the azure ether beyond. Some are dinning in our ears that we Americans, and moderns generally, are intellectual dwarves compared with the ancients, or even the Elizabethan men. But what is that to the purpose? A living dog is better than a dead lion. Shall a man go and hang himself because he belongs to the race of pygmies and not be the biggest pygmy that he can? Let every one mind his own business, and endeavor to be what he was made. Why should we be in such a desperate haste to succeed, and in such desperate enterprises, if a man does not keep pace with his companions? Perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music which he hears, however measured or far away. It is not important that he should mature as soon as an apple tree or an oak. Shall he turn his spring into summer? If the condition of things which we were made for is not yet, what were any reality which we can substitute? We will not be shipwrecked on a vain reality. Shall we with pains erect a heaven of blue glass over ourselves, though when it is done we shall be sure to gaze still at the true ethereal heaven, far above, as if the former were not? There was an artist in the city of Koru who was disposed to strive after perfection. One day it came into his mind to make a staff. Having considered that in an imperfect work time is an ingredient, but in a perfect work time does not enter, he said to himself, It shall be perfect in all respects, though I should do nothing else in my life. He proceeded instantly to the forest for wood, being resolved that it should not be made of unsuitable material and as he searched for and rejected stick after stick, his friends gradually deserted him, for they grew old in their works and died. But he grew not older by a moment. His singleness of purpose and resolution and his elevated piety endowed him, without his knowledge, with perennial youth. As he made no compromise with time, time kept out of his way and only sighed at a distance because he could not overcome him. Before he had found a stock in all respects suitable, the city of Kuru was a hoary ruin, and he sat on one of its mounds to peel the stick. Before he had given it the proper shape, the dynasty of the Kandahars was at an end, and with the point of the stick he wrote the name of the last of that race in the sand, and then resumed his work. By the time he had smoothed and polished the staff, Kalpa was no longer the pole star, and ere he had put on the ferule and the head adorned with precious stones, Brahma had awoke and slumbered many times. But why do I stay to mention these things? When the finishing stroke was put to his work, it suddenly expanded before the eyes of the astonished artist into the fairest of all the creations of Brahma. He had made a new system in making a staff, a world with full and fair proportions, 
in which, though the old cities and dynasties had passed away, fairer and more glorious ones had taken their place. And now he saw by the heap of shavings still fresh at his feet, that for him and his work the former lapse of time had been an illusion, and that no more time had elapsed than is required for a single scintillation of the brain of Brahma to fall on and inflame the tinder of a mortal brain. The material was pure, and his art was pure. How could the result be other than wonderful? No face which we give to a matter will steed us so well at last as the truth. This alone wears well. For the most part we are not where we are, but in a false position. Through an infinity of our natures we suppose a case and put ourselves into it, and hence are in two cases at the same time, and it is doubly difficult to get out. In sane moments we regard only the facts, the case, that is. Say what you have to say, not what you ought. Any truth is better than make-believe. Tom Hyde, the tinker, standing on the gallows, was asked if he had anything to say. Tell the tailors, said he, to remember to make a knot in their thread before they take the first stitch. His companion's prayer is forgotten. However mean your life is, meet it and live it. Do not shun it and call it hard names. It is not so bad as you are. It looks poorest when you are richest. The fault-finder will find faults even in paradise. Love your life poor as it is. You may perhaps have some pleasant, thrilling, glorious hours, even in a poor house. The setting sun is reflected from the windows of the almshouse as brightly as from the rich man's abode. The snow melts before its door as early in the spring. I do not see but a quiet mind may live as contentedly there, and have as cheering thoughts as in a palace. The town's poor seem to me often to live the most independent lives of any. Maybe they are simply great enough to receive without misgiving. Most think that they are above being supported by the town but it oftener happens that they are not above supporting themselves by dishonest means, which should be more disreputable. Cultivate poverty like a garden herb, like sage. Do not trouble yourself much to get new things, whether clothes or friends. Turn the old, return to them. Things do not change we change. Sell your clothes and keep your thoughts. God will see that you do not want society. If I were confined to a corner of a garret all my days like a spider, the world would be just as large to me while I had my thoughts about me. The philosopher said, from an army of three divisions one can take away its general and put it in disorder. From the man, the most abject and vulgar, one cannot take away his thought. Do not seek so anxiously to be developed, to subject yourself to many influences to be played on. It is all dissipation. Humility like darkness reveals the heavenly lights. The shadows of poverty and meanness gather around us, and lo, creation widens to our view. We are often reminded that if there were bestowed on us the wealth of Croesus, our aims must still be the same, 
and our means essentially the same. Moreover, if you are restricted in your range by poverty, if you cannot buy books and newspapers, for instance, you are but confined to the most significant and vital experiences. You are compelled to deal with the material which yields the most sugar and the most starch. It is life near the bone where it is sweetest. You are defended from being a trifler. No man loses ever on a lower level by magnanimity on a higher. Superfluous wealth can buy superfluities only. Money is not required to buy one necessary of the soul. I live in the angle of a leaden wall, into whose composition was poured a little alloy of bell metal. Often in the repose of my midday, there reaches my ears a confused tintinabulum from without. It is the noise of my contemporaries. My neighbors tell me of their adventures with famous gentlemen and ladies, what notabilities they met at the dinner table. But I am no more interested in such things than in the content of the Daily Times. The interest and the conversation are about costume and manners, chiefly. But a goose is a goose still. Dress it as you will. They tell me of California and Texas, of England and the Indies, of the Honorable Mr. Blank, of Georgia or of Massachusetts. All transient and fleeting phenomena, till I am ready to leap from their courtyard like the Mameluke Bay. I delight to come to my bearings, not walk in procession with pomp and parade in a conspicuous place but to walk even with the builder of the universe, if I may, not to live in this restless, nervous, bustling, trivial nineteenth century, but stand or sit thoughtfully while it goes by. What are men celebrating? They are all on a committee of arrangements, and hourly expect a speech from somebody. God is only the president of the day, and Webster is his orator. I love to weigh, to settle, to gravitate toward that which most strongly and rightfully attracts me, not hang by the beam of the scale and try to weigh less, not suppose a case, but take the case that is, to travel the only path I can and that on which no power can resist me. It affords me no satisfaction to commerce, to spring an arch before I have got a solid foundation. Let us not play at kitley benders. There is a solid bottom everywhere. We read that the traveler asked the boy if the swamp before him had a hard bottom. The boy replied that it had. But presently the traveller's horse sank in up to the girths, and he observed to the boy, I thought you said this bog had a hard bottom. So it has, answered the latter, but you've not got halfway to it yet. So it is with the bogs and quicksands of society. But he is an old boy that knows it. Only what is thought, said or done, at a certain rare coincidence is good. I would not be one of those who will foolishly drive a nail into mere lathe and plastering. Such a deed would keep me awake nights. Give me a hammer, and let me feel for the furring. Do not depend on the putty. Drive a nail home, and clinch it so faithfully that you can wake up in the night and think of your work with satisfaction, a work at which you would not be ashamed to invoke the muse. So will help you God, and so only. Every nail driven should be as another rivet in the machine of the universe. 
you carrying on the work, rather than love, than money, than fame. Give me truth. I sat at a table where rich food and wine in abundance and obsequious attendance, but sincerity and truth were not, and I went away hungry from the inhospitable board. The hospitality was as cold as the ices. I thought that there was no need of ice to freeze them. They talked to me of the age, of the wine, and the fame of the vintage. But I thought of an older, a newer, and purer wine, of a more glorious vintage, which they had not got, and could not buy. The style, the house and grounds, and entertainment pass for nothing with me. I called on the king, but he made me wait in his hall, and conducted like a man incapacitated for hospitality. There was a man in my neighborhood who lived in a hollow tree. His manners were truly regal. I should have done better had I called on him. How long shall we sit in our porticos, practicing idle and musty virtues, which any work would make impertinent? As if one were to begin the day with long suffering, and hire a man to hoe his potatoes, and in the afternoon go forth to practice Christian meekness and charity with goodness aforethought. Consider the china, pride, and stagnant self-complacency of mankind. This generation inclines a little to congratulate itself on being the last of an illustrious line, and in Boston, and London, and Paris, and Rome, thinking of its long descent, it speaks of its progress in art and science and literature with satisfaction. There are the records of the philosophical societies, and the public eulogies of great men. It is the good Adam contemplating his own virtue. Yes, we have done great deeds, and sung divine songs which shall never die. That is, as long as we can remember them. The learned societies and great men of Assyria, where are they? What youthful philosophers and experimentalists we are! There is not one of my readers who has yet lived a whole human life. These may be but the spring months in the life of the race. If we have had the seven years itch, we have not seen the seventeen-year locust yet in Concord. We are acquainted with a mere pellicle of the globe on which we live. Most have not delved six feet beneath the surface, nor leaped as many above it. We know not where we are. Beside, we are sound asleep nearly half our time. Yet we esteem ourselves wise, and have an established order on the surface. Truly we are deep thinkers, we are ambitious spirits. As I stand over the insect crawling amid the pine needles on the forest floor, and endeavoring to conceal itself from my sight, and ask myself why it will cherish those humble thoughts, and bide its head from me who might perhaps be its benefactor, and impart to its race some cheering information. I am reminded of the greater benefactor and intelligence that stands over me, the human insect. There is an incessant influx of novelty into the world, and yet we tolerate incredible dullness. I need only suggest what kind of sermons are still listened to in the most enlightened countries. There are such words as joy and sorrow, but they are only the burden of a psalm, sung with a nasal twang, while we believe in the ordinary and mean. We think that we can change our clothes only. It is said that the British Empire is very large and respectable, 
and the United States are a first-rate power. We do not believe that a tide rises and falls behind every man which can float the British Empire like a chip, if he should ever harbor it in his mind. Who knows what sort of seventeen-year locust will next come out of the ground? The government of the world I live in was not framed like that of Britain in after-dinner conversations over the wine. The life in us is like the water in the river. It may rise this year higher than man has ever known it, and flood the parched uplands. Even this may be the eventful year which will drown out all our muskrats. It was not always dry land where we dwell. I see far inland the banks which the stream anciently washed, before science began to record its freshets. Every one has heard the story which has gone the rounds of New England of a strong and beautiful bug which came out of the dry leaf of an old table of apple-tree wood which had stood in a farmer's kitchen for sixty years, first in Connecticut and afterward in Massachusetts, from an egg deposited in the living tree many years earlier still, as appeared by counting the annual layers beyond it, which was heard gnawing out for several weeks, hatched perchance by the heat of an urn. Who does not feel his faith in a resurrection and immortality strengthened by hearing of this? Who knows what beautiful and winged life, whose egg has been buried for ages under many concentric layers of woodenness in the dead dry life of society, deposited at first in the alburnum of the green and living tree, which has been gradually converted into the semblance of its well-seasoned tomb, heard perchance gnawing out now for years by the astonished family of man as they sat round the festive board, may unexpectedly come forth from amidst society's most trivial and hand-celled furniture to enjoy its perfect summer life at last. I do not say that John or Jonathan will realize all this, but such is the character of that morrow, which mere lapse of time can never make to dawn. The light which puts out our eyes is darkness to us. Only that day dawns to which we are awake. There is more day to dawn. The sun is but a morning star. End of Conclusion End of Walden This book read by Gordon Mackenzie Finished July the 7th, 2006